Hello there, my name is John Senegal and I'm a solution architect at Red Hat, working with partners around AI and edge technology. Shovik and I are gonna to talk to you about a particular AI use case, parsing engineering diagrams using deep learning and graph search. But before we get into the use case, I'd like to talk to you about the technology that makes this use case possible at scale. Shovik, you'd like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shovik Mani, and I'm a data scientist at C3 AI. Um, I work on building uh, machine learning applications uh, for industrial use cases, such as you know, predictive maintenance, fraud detection, and process optimization. Uh, very excited to uh, share uh, an, an exciting application with you um, on uh, digitizing engineering diagrams uh, and, and making use of them in the AI applications that we build. That's awesome. Thank you, Shovik. All right, let's get started. So today, I'm going to do an introduction on the technology that enables uh, this particular use case that Shovik is going to talk to you about. And as part of that, I'm going to talk to you about why Kubernetes makes sense for AI workloads. And then Shovik is going to get into this very special use case that we'd like to talk to you about. So let's get started with what are some of the, the problems that exist in, in, in operationalizing AI ML? Um, we know that it's not trivial. Uh, we know that as part of this whole life cycle of creating models, you have to have business leadership that understands the problem space and what they're trying to accomplish. And then of course you gotta find and scavenge a hunt for the right kind of data, parse that data, clean that data, make it available to the data scientists, who then build the models, who then you work with developers to integrate those models. And then those models have to be monitored and managed for drift and make sure that they are constantly update, updated and doing the things that you're expecting uh, them to do. So taking a model, taking an idea and going from idea to in production is not a trivial task. In addition to that, the problems with actually making that happen is talent shortage. There's not a lot of Shoviks in the world, data scientists who understand this space. And so some companies have difficulties finding these, these types of resources. Also getting tools and getting tools are available to them as they need them, when they need them, on the environment that they need them can be difficult as well. And then being able to take these projects and operationalize them, as we talked about on the previous slide, can be very complicated sometimes, depending on the project, depending on how large, depending on the requirements. Enter Kubernetes. And this is where Kubernetes makes sense for AI workloads. First of all, Kubernetes brings agility. What does that really mean? It means that when you have these types of pro projects, um, Kubernetes gives you the ability for resource management. So as your requirements and your demand for resources, um, uh, seek compute power for memory, all of those increase when you're deploying AI workloads. Kubernetes gives you the opportunity to request resources on demand to scale up and scale down uh, as required. The other thing is consistency and portability. Kubernetes is an open source project, right? And so with Red Hat OpenShift, uh, the leading Kubernetes platform, we give you the ability to have a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud model that allows you to run these workloads anywhere. So now if you wanna run the workload on-prem, if you wanna run it in any cloud, you can have the common platform that runs these workloads anywhere the requirements are uh, directed. You have flexibility. You have the ability, excuse me, to, to spin up new AI ML projects as needed. So if a data scientist has a bright idea about creating a new model, in this kind of platform, he has the ability to spin up projects as needed, get the resources, get the tools that are required uh, to, to play around with his project. And most important is scalability. We know when you're running AI ML workloads, 
the ability to scale up and scale down based on demands, based on the requirements of the workload and the application is critical uh, for the success of these kinds of workloads. In order to do that, you need a whole platform of things that can support this life cycle of building and deploying models. So at the bottom, you of course need some infrastructure. You need uh, a cloud, public or private, uh, uh, virtual. Maybe you wanna run this stuff on the edge, but you need hardware, of course. You may need compute acceleration. So we support GPUs as part of OpenShift. And then the next layer is where Red Hat OpenShift is. You need a Kubernetes platform based on what I described before, because that platform will give you the agility, flexibility, scalability, and portability we talked about. And then of course you need data pipeline services. You need ML DevOps kinds of tools to build and deploy those models. So in order to execute this life cycle, you need an entire platform like this. One of the things we did when we looked into this of why Kubernetes makes sense is when you talk to customers, they understand those issues that I, I talked about earlier. And 94% of them have decided that, or have already decided that they will containerize the AI ML workloads within the next year. Either they've done it or they will do it within the next year because they understand the value that containerized workloads running on a Kubernetes platform has for them. And so in order to support that, Red Hat has the hybrid multi-cloud platform that I talked about that is the Kubernetes platform. But in order to complete the stack, we have to partner with other people. And so we partner with NVIDIA and Intel around hardware and um, compute acceleration. And of course, we partner now with uh, C3 AI. C3 AI provides those features and functions we talked about before in terms of ML, DevOps kinds of tools, data services. They complete the picture and allow the, the, the life cycle to happen. And our platform supports them in doing that. What we bring to the table in this partnership is ease of deployment, consistency, and portability, like we talked about before. And Red Hat is the leading uh, Kubernetes uh, distribution um, in the industry. What C3 AI brings to the table is the ability to deliver enterprise AI at a global scale. Also, rapid development and deployment and the ability to operationalize AI. So when we talk about technology that will support the use case we're going to cover, of course, a reference architecture is a great place to start. But actually, this is where we're going to stop. We're not going to get any deeper into this. But I must say, you can see Red Hat in the picture as a supporting common platform across all of those environments, public cloud, VMs, Intel, NVIDIA, one platform to support anywhere you want to run your AI ML workload. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Shovik now so he can tell you more about C3 AI and get into the depths of our use case. Shovik? Thank you, John. Uh, thanks for the excellent introduction of uh, Kubernetes and um, how it uh, is applicable to data science and, and data scientists. Um, and you know, at a high level, the thing I like about you know Kubernetes and, and containers, um, OpenShift, right, is that as a data scientist, uh, you don't have to worry about hardware, right, or spinning up uh, you know a, a GPU or a specific container. All of that is automated, uh, and you can you know get to work and and do the machine learning that you love. Uh, so really, this this uh, Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, powers our uh, C3 AI um, platform, or the, the C3 AI suite. Um, and what the suite is, is it's a model-driven architecture consisting of features uh, such as um, an integrated development studio to uh, design and, and uh, build applications, uh, data integration cap capabilities, um, integrating data from disparate sources, 
uh, operations and security. Um, and finally, a whole host of um, AI model uh, development, deployment, uh, ML model uh, operations uh, to, to speed up uh, the, the model development and deployment process. So uh, this, this C3 AI suite, uh, we expose this functionality using APIs. Uh, and these APIs are used by uh, the applications that we build on top of them. So that will be our focus for today. Uh, I want to tell you about a specific application um, that, that you know, we, we uh, offer at, at C3. And I also want to talk about uh, a specific capability of the application uh, which is uh, this capability of parsing engineering diagrams uh, and being able to extract structured information from highly unstructured uh, and noisy uh, diagrams. So, so let's start with the, the context um, and the application. Um, so the application we're going to be looking at here is uh, C3 AI Reliability, which is uh, one of our uh, flagship AI applications uh, from, from C3. And what this is, is this is a system of systems anomaly detection application. So what, what do I mean by system of systems? Imagine uh, you are the operator uh, of some industrial facility. Let's say, you know, uh, an offshore oil rig. Um, you have a lot of systems at your disposal. Um, and there is a hierarchy, right? So you may have a compressor train system. Um, and then in that system, you have multiple subsystems, right? So you may have a power turbine in that compressor train. You may have um, a gearbox. You may have uh, a gas generator um, and, and so on. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, you have um, telemetry from all of these various subsystems, uh, different levels of your hierarchy. And, you know, you want a way to understand the health of uh, your entire plant at uh, both the system level as well as the subsystem levels. So what the C3 AI reliability application does is it integrates all of these disparate data sources, such as you know time series telemetry data from, from Pi sensors. Um, it takes in uh, work orders and maintenance logs. Uh, it takes in engineering diagrams. And it first builds a unified image of your facility. And then uh, you know using machine learning models, it um, estimates the risk for each of these system and, and subsystems. So uh, you're able to predict uh, when um, uh, you know, some uh, anomaly outlier is, is going to occur and, and take um, action uh, to, to fix that. So as I said, uh, this application consumes a variety of data. Uh, and our focus for the talk today will be a um, uh, class of data we call engineering diagrams, and, and specifically piping and instrumentation diagrams, or PNIDs. Um, you know, the, these PNIDs uh, represent a map of an industrial facility, um, and it tells you various features of a facility, such as where certain equipment are located, uh, how equipment are connected to each other, um, and uh, how equipments are identified. Um, and what happens is we, we take this hierarchy and we use this to create our system of systems data model in, in the reliability application. Uh, but again, the, the engineering diagrams are, are key to creating that hierarchy because you know, they, they tell us how uh, these, uh, these equipment, um, as well as the sensors, uh, are, uh, are placed in this hierarchy. So let's dive into the engineering diagrams themselves, and um, this will clarify uh, how how they're actually used by the, the reliability applications. Um, so, so these engineering diagrams are um, you know crucial data source for for any industrial facility. Um, they're drafted during you know the design of the facility. Uh, they're used um, during operations and maintenance to to identify where equipment and sensors are. Um, and they're also used during safety checks. So, um, you know, in, in, in certain jurisdictions, there's actually uh, requirements to keep these engineering diagrams up to date uh, because, you know, they are the most up to date living kind of uh, representation of a facility. 
And this is an example of uh, an engineering diagram. This is called a piping and instrumentation diagram, as I said, or, or PNID. And um, you, as you can see, it's, it's a collection of symbols and text and uh, lines between these symbols. And I want to peel this apart and tell you what it, what it means, what it conveys. So first of all, you see, um, uh, let's, let's go over here. Yeah, so, so, so you see uh, you have some big equipment symbols like this E321 or this V329. So V329, this is a, a vessel. Um, this is some other equipment. So, so large, large symbols are, are equipment. Then you have uh, these circles. Um, these circles are called locally mounted instruments. Uh, so these are actual physical um, sensors. So like a pressure ga gauge or, or a, a temperature indicator, uh, which you'll find on the facility uh, floor. And then you'll notice that these circular symbols are often always connected to this interesting symbol, which is a, it's a circle inside a square. And these are called tags. And tags, tags are the, the um, digital representation of uh, the sensor. So if you can see this tag here, it says PIC3030. Uh, and uh, what would happen is if you go to uh, their PI database or their time series uh, sensor database, uh, you can actually find an entry uh, under PIC3030. And you can fetch all of the time series data coming from this tag here. So you know, as you can tell, really, this, this is a map of the facility. And having a good understanding of this um, lets us recreate the systems of systems asset hierarchy, uh, which will power our C3I reliability applications. The final thing I want to note, note is uh, often you'll see uh, lines uh, in, in these diagrams. So whenever you have uh, solid lines, those are physical process lines, uh, so lines that carry you know, fluid. Um, and sometimes you'll see uh, dash lines. And, and those dash lines are electrical signals, um, which makes sense, right? So you have uh, some sensor, um, and you, know, you have some electrical signal to, you know, it's, it's like digital representation. So that's how to, how to read these diagrams. Um, the, the key scope of parsing these diagrams is to be able to detect these tags. So you want to be able to detect these tags in a diagram, uh, be able to parse out the text, and then you know um, if you have a list of tags in a, in a diagram, you, you you have a sense of where everything is located, right? So for a typical facility, you may have thousands of diagrams, um, and if you didn't have a, a way to automatically parse them, uh, you know you'd have some some you know poor employee sitting through uh, thousands of pages trying to manually construct this hier hierarchy. So, so the goal of this uh, diagram parsing will be three steps. Uh, number one, to, to detect uh, these tag and LMI symbols. Number two, to detect the text, to detect and parse the text inside these specific symbols. And number three, uh, to detect connections between various symbols so that we can link symbols to each other in this asset hierarchy. OK, so, so let's get started. Um, First, I'd like to give you an overview of our uh, machine learning pipeline, which we use to uh, digitize these diagrams. Um, as input, this pipeline takes in um, the image of the diagram, as well as an optional set of manually labeled symbols, such as equipment. So, so these are you know, one-off symbols, which uh, you know, we can't really train a model for, but you know, the user can scaffold the um, uh, automated diagram parsing process by providing these, these kind of one-off symbols as, as, as labels. So that's what the green boxes represent. Then um, we process it through a series of steps. Number one is symbol detection, which we use to detect uh, the tag and the LMI symbols, as I said. Uh, number two is text recognition and association to detect the text. Uh, number three, connection detection to de detect the connections between the various tags, LMI, and uh, equipment in the diagram. And the output of this pipeline is uh, what we call an asset hierarchy. 
So essentially, it's a structured representation um, of this highly unstructured um, uh, image, right? So it tells you which symbols have been found, whether they've been manually labeled by the user or detected by the pipeline, what kind of symbol that is, whether it's an equipment, a tag, or an LMI, locally mounted instrument, uh, the text which has been parsed um, for that symbol, as well as other symbols which it's connected to. So it gives you all you really need to know uh, about this diagram and, and its contents. Uh, before going into more detail on you know, the, the secret sauce and, and the AI models which uh, make this all work, um, I'd like to go through a demo um, in, in a Jupyter Notebook. And uh, specifically, this is uh, what we call a containerized Jupyter Notebook. Um, and um, yeah, this is um, you know, C3 software, which, will, which can uh, run on Red Hat in a container. Um, and it lets the data scientists easily uh, train and deploy models and collaborate with other data scientists without having to worry too much about infrastructure. And so here we have a, a C3 containerized notebook where we are demoing this uh, pipeline for diagram parsing. Uh, so the first thing we do is uh, we uh, load uh, example diagram. And you notice that um, a lot of these uh, calls are made from the C3 handle. Uh, so this is a, you know, a library that's automatically lo loaded in. And it contains uh, the whole, uh, you know, it, 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 lets, it lets me uh, access all of the data as well as the functionality of the C3i suite. So that's how the APIs are exposed uh, to, to me as, as a data scientist. Um, so I take this diagram um, and I convert it to a parsable diagram object. Uh, here you can see, you see that diagram. It's the same diagram I was showing in the slides. As I mentioned, we let the user specify a set of manually labeled symbols. In this case, they pass it in as an XML file. And uh, here we have a set of five manually labeled symbols, which the user has specified, as well as the text that the user has labeled. And so you see uh, five of these manually labeled symbols, uh, zero or zero, one, two, three, four. And these are equipment symbols, which our pipeline otherwise couldn't detect. Um, and then we get started with our pipeline. The first step in our pipeline is uh, a symbol detection step. Uh, in which we use uh, a CNN or a convolutional neural network uh, to look at uh, crops of the image and classify them as a tag symbol, an LMI symbol, or not a symbol. So that's why you have this one by three dimensional uh, output at the end. Um, and notice what we do here is uh, we initialize a um, uh, machine learning pipe called a symbol detection pipe. Um, and you know, in, in, in the C3 AI suite, the way we think of machine learning, the way we do machine learning is through this concept of pipelines. So we have a pipe for symbol detection. We have some uh, hyperparameters, some other metadata, uh, the path to the model, which we want to use for the step. And once we have initialized this pipe, uh, we pass the parsable diagram. So remember, the parsable diagram is the object which, which contains the, the diagram itself, as well as manually labeled symbols. So we, we parse that diagram, and oh, we pass that diagram, and we process it using the pipe. And what we get is we get another parsable diagram. Um, and now, if we display that parsable diagram, you notice we have a whole new set of symbols in red, which is what the pipeline has detected. Um, so you see, you know, some of them are tag symbols, some of them are LMIs. Um, so those those look correct. Um, you'll notice that sometimes uh, the pipeline makes mistakes. Like for example, this is uh, not an LMI symbol. This is a completely different symbol. This is an oval, whereas LMI symbols uh, should be circles. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it 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 does make some some mistakes, like overlapping symbol. But if you look for the vast majority of cases, uh, this is really good detection. And we're able to isolate where these sensors are and where these uh, LMIs are. And, and that's very exciting to someone who would have to otherwise 
you know, parse each of these individually to create um, our systems of systems asset hierarchy. And the great thing, right, is now we can take this um, uh, diagram and we can convert it into a structured um, asset hierarchy, right? So you see these are all, uh, these five uh, were the manually labeled symbols we started out with. But now we have a whole set of detected symbols in this diagram. And that's, you know, that's done automatically. The next step is the text to recognition step, where um, again, we pass in the same parsable diagram into now this text recognition pipe. And um, the output we get out of that is, uh, now you see this column has been filled in, um, and that's the text which has been detected uh, inside or nearby those symbols. So for example, let's take a symbol like um, this one, maybe this one here, uh, PT83030, and we see the ID is 24. So 24 should say something like PT83030. We can look it up in our table here, and we see, sure enough, uh, uh, symbol 25 was detected as an LMI, and we see the associated text to that symbol. Um, this is just another visualization of the text which has been detected in green and blue. Um, the symbols, again, detected symbols in red, and the manually labeled symbols in green. And finally, we have the connection detection step in which we use a, a graph search to uh, parse the diagram, you know, to, to traverse the diagram and detect connections between symbols. Uh, now you see this column has been populated and you can see for each symbol, uh, we give you a list of uh, symbols, other symbols that it's connected to. And this can be used uh, later in, in, in downstream um, use cases, right, to, to be able to um, know how symbols are connected to each other. Um, and, you know, for example, you know, say you had equipment in red and you wanted to know what sensors to monitor, right, to do predictive maintenance on this equipment. Well, now with this connection detection, now you know that all these symbols in green are actually connected to the symbol in red. Um, and so you could get the data, you can get the sensor data from these green symbols and use it to, to monitor this equipment. So, so that's a rundown of the um, uh, pipeline as we have it. Um, I'd like to go back now and I'd like to give you some details on how we train this pipeline. Uh, first, to train this symbol detection uh, model, this uh, CNN network that I uh, mentioned, we first labeled a lot of diagrams. So we just sat there labeling the data. Uh, we labeled 18 diagrams in our training set. Um, and we uh, specifically, we labeled all the tags. So we you know, drew bounding boxes around those tags. We drew all of the LMI symbols. And we randomly sampled a ton of not symbol crops. Uh, and so this, you know, essentially created a data set that we could train on. Then we um, created this, this model um, and, and trained this model on the data set. So for each crop which we had labeled, um, you know, we had an, a corresponding output for whether it's a tag or LMI or not a symbol. And we trained the network to predict on crops uh, and give us their, their classification. Um, then, uh, you know, we, we took these manually labeled symbols um, and then uh, on this diagram, we took a sliding window and we passed it over the diagram. Um, and each sliding window, each crop, we passed it through our network. And using that, uh, we were able to get the actual predictions for where all the sensors were located. And so this is the result I showed you earlier of all of the uh, tag and LMI symbols in red being detected by the pipeline. So that's uh, symbol detection. Um, the next step, which is uh, the text recognition. Uh, for, for text recognition, what we did is we used a, a pre-trained um, uh, text uh, recognition um, network called EAST. Uh, so this was just available off the shelf. And we used it to detect regions of text that you see here in blue. After that, we took these regions and we processed them using Tesseract OCR. 
And uh, based on proximity, we map them to, to our detected symbols. So in this case, you see this LMI uh, symbol here, and you see inside it, you have two of these detected text regions. Um, so once you process that using OCR, you're able to say that, okay, this PD3030 belongs to, to this uh, LMI symbol, and that's how we do this association. Finally, we have um, this connection detection step, which um, I believe is the most sophisticated part of this pipeline. Um, and a part of that you know, excites me the most as a data scientist. Um, so connection detection, again, is this problem of uh, finding uh, which symbols are connected to each other by other lines. And the lines, again, they can be physical process lines, like you see here, like a pipe, or they can be like a electrical signal, right? Like um, a sensor to a database. Uh, what we do for uh, this connection detection is we actually take the image and we represent this as a graph. So you have um, a graph of pixels in this case, and you have symbols, which are you know, sets of pixels. So you have four symbols here. And we do a graph search going from symbol to symbol, following the lines, which you see as, as these black dots in this graph. Um, you can imagine, right, this presents a difficulty, right, when you're trying to traverse these dashed lines. Um, because uh, you know you, your graph search, right? It, it'll hit a roadblock. It won't be able to traverse um, these uh, dashed lines. So we also have an additional step where we use a probabilistic Hopf trans transform to fill in those dashed lines. And now suddenly your graph search can traverse through those dashed lines and solid lines and find connections along the way. So using this graph search process, what we're able to do is for each source symbol, in this case, the red symbol, we're able to find connections to um, other symbols in the diagrams through these lines. So for example, you see here, uh, so, and then the connections that the path traversed by the graph search is shown in blue. So here you see that from this symbol, um, you know, we follow a traversal down this path, down this path, and we're able to hit this connected symbol. Um, you know, similarly, sometimes, you know, it takes an exhaustive search. It goes all the way down here. If, um, you know, poor thing doesn't find any symbols, so it, so it comes back, um, and maybe it finds some symbol here. So really, it's, it's able to traverse this diagram and, and find connected symbols. Um, and again, as the output, what we get is we get a structured asset hierarchy table, right? For each symbol in the diagram, we're able to tell you what kind of symbol it is, what kind of text uh, is inside or around the symbol, and what other symbols is this, this is connected to. Um, this associated text here, uh, it, this is actually key for our reliability application, which I introduced. Because often from customers, we get you know, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of these diagrams, and we get a list with, again, thousands of uh, tag IDs, right? Pi tag IDs, which uh, help us fetch the data. And we have no way of mapping between those two, right? We have no way of knowing um, you know, uh, how to get data for a specific symbol in the diagram, uh, unless we you know, manually parse those, those things. But now with this diagram digitization pipeline, we can automatically detect the tags and we can detect the associated text. And if we match this associated text against the uh, time series data, uh, then we can suddenly fetch uh, data for, for any tags that, that we wish, in, wish in, in the diagram. Um, finally, presenting some, some results of this pipeline, um, you know, in symbol detection, we had very good performance for tag detection in terms of precision and recall. And as you can see in the test set, we, we achieved you know, uh, essentially 100% precision and recall, perfect classification. Whereas for the LMI symbols, they're, they're a little harder pro problem to crack. So we had a little poorer, but still you can get you know, 90, almost 90% 90 recall with uh, relatively high precision. Um, this is a sample of, of the symbol detection results where you see the you know, ground truth labels, which you know, we labeled in green, versus the um, labels by the, the machine learning model CNN in red. 
Uh, and you can see they're they're pretty close overall. And finally, as as a next step, as a, a taste of uh, what we're working on right now, uh, we're working on expanding this in in future directions, uh, including uh, using RCNN, which is a, a region proposal neural network. Um, and this, uh, as you can see in the bottom, so this is an RCNN. Uh, this will help us get better. Um, uh, bounding boxes around these symbols, um, and it'll help us avoid a sliding window approach, which we had introduced earlier. Um, so ex we're excited for this new development and, and for the improved results that it brings us. So overall, you know, at, at C3, we build uh, AI applications. Uh, we build applications that work on a lot of disparate data sources from time series data to uh, maintenance data, to engineering diagrams. Um, and oftentimes, uh, it turns out that these diagrams are uh, you know, key data structures to, to getting these applications uh, to, to work and, and to work as the, the way you want them. So with this diagram digitization pipeline, we'll be able to power applications such as uh, C3i reliability. Uh, and we're also able to create new generations of applications, everything from diagram search uh, to equipment sensor mapping, and eventually the creation of a facility-wide digital twin so that you know um, where all of your sensors and equipment are located, which uh, time series uh, data they're connected to, um, and you have an you know, uh, overall view of, of your facility. Thank you for your time. Jovan. Shovik, that was awesome. That was some good stuff. Um, I'm glad. Hope, hope the audience liked it. Um, I'm glad you're still awake. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be around to answer questions. So thank you for joining us for our session and ask away.